Hi, this is Usha. Welcome to Rathod's IS classes. Today in this lecture, we are going to see current affairs of 5th February 2022. In this lecture, we are going to discuss seven topics which are very much relevant from our UPSC point of view. So now let us try to see a brief introduction regarding those topics. Now we are going to have our discussion. So first topic it is regarding interrogating the false merit reservation binary. So this article which is talking about all India quota, especially for this need. Okay. So this topic it is important from your policy point of view. And we are going to discuss the important points regarding this article which is very much relevant from our UPSC. And next topic it is regarding India calling with quite a lot of trade in mind. Okay. So this article which is mainly talking about free trade agreement between India and UK. And this topic is important regarding international relations and even we can connect this topic under our economy point of view as well. And next topic it is regarding sex and violence. So this article which is mainly talking about marital rape. Okay, that is section 375 of IPC. So there is one exception regarding this section that is regarding this marital rape. So this article is important from your policy point of view which mainly comes under GS paper too. And next topic it is regarding Prime Minister to spend over six and a half hours in city today. Okay, he is going to spend six and a half hours in Hyderabad. So this article is important from history because he is going to visit one important, uh, important site. So this is very much important from our history point of view. And next topic it is regarding uniform civil code. So this topic it is exclusively important from your polity and it is very important from your mains and as well as prelims point of view. And next topic it is about villagers resist sanctuary tag for this langur habitat. And this topic is important from your environment and ecology. And next topic it is regarding CPEC China Pakistan Economic Corridor Agreement between in uh, Pakistan and China. So uh, this is very important from your international relations which mainly comes in the GS paper too. So these are the topics now we are going to have our discussion. So let's get started with our discussion and let us try to see the quote. So this quote it is by Nelson Mandela. So quote mainly says that winner is a dreamer who never gives up. So not only having the dreams but you need to work hard to achieve your dreams okay so winner is a dreamer who never give up that means so he winner will have the dreams okay so he will try very much hard to achieve his dreams and this quote is relevant from our UBSC point of view dreaming it is not at all enough but to achieve our dreams we need to work hard okay so now let us try to see the first topic it is regarding all India quota okay title says interrogating false merit reservation binary so this article is talking about this all India quota so we need to know about recent Supreme Court judgment regarding this all India quota regarding this neat entrance test so if you're talking about the first thing that is context so before seeing context if you see this infographic I took directly from the Hindu but not today's newspaper but this from earlier newspaper cut so merit cannot be reduced to narrow definitions of performance in an open competitive examination. So this open competitive examination which only provides formal equality of opportunity and high scores in an exam they are not a proxy for merit. Merit should be socially contextualized and reconceptualized as an instrument that advances social goals like equality in such a context. Reservation is not at odds with merit. So actually this is the thing which mainly said by Supreme Court. Supreme Court said that whenever we are going for conducting of this open competitive examination. So this examination will provide only formal equality of opportunity. So if you are talking about, if, if you are talking about especially regarding the social good. So deservation it is a good thing. Okay, it is not a like, which is not an odds as merit. So this is the thing which is mainly said by our Supreme Court itself. So now let us go back and let us try to see what is the context. If you see context, Supreme Court has pronounced its decision upholding this constitutional validity for providing 27 percentage of quota to OBC that is other backward classes 
and NEET in NEET all India quota seats for undergraduation and as well as post graduation courses so for this post graduation and undergraduation courses okay so there is an exam called as NEET so for this NEET there is 27 percentage of quota for this OBCs okay so Supreme Court came up with a decision like upholding yes constitution there is a constitutional validity for providing this 27 percentage of quota for this other backward classes in this NEET so we are talking about what is the issue issue here is petitioners okay petitioners and as well as several NEET aspirants they argued that since top court came up with a reservation limit it is like 50 percentage not more than 50 percentage in the famous Indra Sahani case in the famous Indra Sahani case Supreme Court said that reservation should not be crossed over 50 percentage and government should have first appeal applied to the court before tinkering the quota calculations so now here states say that they are going to give so and so 10 percent reservation for this economically weaker sections and 27 percent for this OBCs so because of this state should first they need to go for up go for applied okay applied to the court before thinkering the quota calculation so they need to see this 50 percentage of reservation so which is mainly said by supreme court in this famous uh, in the sahani case and court also further confirmed that there is no need for the center to uh, have got the prior consent of the supreme court introducing this obc quota in this all india quota seats for need so for this need now the yes, central government uh, have not got the prior consent that means it is no need to get the prior consent yes we can go for giving off or providing of 20 per 7 percentage of reservation for this obc category and court mainly reason that material affluence of certain individual members of socially backward group or cleamy layer could not be used against the entire group to deny the benefits of the reservation court also said that certain individual members of socially backward group or we can say like creamy layer they could not be used against the entire group to deny the benefits of reservation for example if you are taking any society any any uh, any society or any socially backward group so in any caste we can see there will be the haves and have nots so because of this creamy layer of have has we cannot deny we cannot the deny of uh, deny the benefits of reservations for this entire group so this is the thing which mainly said by supreme court so if you're talking about back background so what is the background government introduced this obs or economically weaker sections quota before the counseling of this need and the candidates who are who are applying for this need pg they are not provided any information regarding the distribution of seat matrix according to this obs and ews quota okay so here because of this the went the petitioner mainly filed the case in the court so we're talking about what are the key observations of this apex court apex court it is nothing but top court so if we're talking about judiciary in india so we are having three tier judiciary at top we have supreme court and at the state level we have high court and at the district level we have subordinate court so this supreme court it is the apex court of the country so if we are talking about what are the observations which is given by this supreme court so the first one is supreme court mainly held that reservation is not at odds with merit okay reservation is not at odds with merit it observed that merit could not be narrowed to the limit of success in the open competitive examinations okay so here whenever we are coming up with reservation it is not affecting this merit and supreme court also said that merit could not be narrowed to the limit of success in the competitive examinations and the merit of a person is a sum of total lived experiences and his or her struggle to overcome cultural social setbacks which is mainly observed by the supreme court so if you're talking about why this landmark judgment came up by the supreme court so first one is merit cannot be reduced to a narrow definitions of performance because in this open competitive examinations so merit will be getting seats okay but if you see historically so these backward classes they were historically they were backward and they are mainly denied uh, with different rights as well so because of this now we need to give some formal opportunities and we need to bring them into the mainstream of our society okay and the co current competences are assessed by the competent examinations they are not reflective of excellence 
capability and potential of an individual. So if we are talking about major justifications for reservations, so first one is whatever the examinations, what are the open competitive examinations that are conducted that will not, that they did not reflect how economical, social and as well as cultural advantages they were occurred or violated for the certain classes of society and examinations they are not proxy for merit and merit should be socially contextualized and reconceptualized and reservation is not at odds with merit but further it distributive impact okay so these are the some important justifications regarding reservations so you have to refer which are the articles which are the articles in our constitution which mainly talks about reservation so this is your homework and now let's try to see next topic it is regarding free trade deal between india and uk title says india calling with quite of uh, quite a lot of trade in mind so this article is very important regarding our international relations and even our economy point of view so now let us try to understand this topic in a very great detail so if you're talking about central theme it mainly says that a new age free trade deal with india remains crucial in anchoring the united kingdom economically to this indo-pacific so whenever this uk which is coming up with this free trade agreement with india then there will be increasing of influence of this uk that is seen in this indo-pacific region as well right so now we need to know about what is this free trade agreement what are the some clauses in this agreement and what's the significance and what are the challenges so this part will be important from our upsc mains point of view so we're talking about context so what is this context says recently very recently india and uk have launched a formal free trade agreement negotiation between these two countries and this free trade agreement it is going to be concluded by the end of 2022 okay so by then so till this agreement which is concluded by the end of 2022 they are mainly complementing interim okay they are mainly complementing interim free trade area so it is a mainly the will results in reducing of tariffs okay it is mainly result in reducing of tariffs of most of the items okay so recently india and uk they have launched a formal free trade agreement negotiations okay so it is going to be finalized by 2022 so until then countries they are complementing with internal free trade area and they may have talked about res, uh, reducing of these tariffs on the most of the items. If you see the map of UK, here we have North Sea, right? So if you're talking about UK, which mainly contains Scotland, it contains England, it contains Wales, and as well as it contains Northern Ireland. So this might be your prelims question, okay? UK contains Scotland. England, Wales and Northern Ireland. So here we have North Sea, here we have Atlantic Ocean and here we have Irish Sea and Celtic Sea, here we have English Channel and Strait of Dover. So these are the some important locations that you need to remember regarding this map. So now let us try to talk about some clauses regarding this agreement. So what are the clauses in our agreement? So both the countries they agreed for an early harvest scheme okay so both the countries they agreed for this early harvest scheme or we can say like a limited trade agreement to lower tariffs and next one is they also agreed to avoid sensitive issues and they want to focus on the areas where there is more complementarity that is present and if you're talking about sensitive sectors in india we can talk about agriculture we can talk about dairy sectors okay and they also targeted the doubling of the trade between india and uk by 2030 by 2030 we are going to have a doubling of the trade between india and uk so if you're talking about what is this free trade agreement so this free trade agreement it is a pact between two or more nations okay it is a pact between two or more nations and they will be focusing on reducing of barriers to reduce the barriers to imports and as well as exports among them okay it is a pact between two or more nations to reduce barriers 
to imports and as well as exports among them. Under this free trade policy, goods and services they can be brought and they can be sold across international borders. And whenever the two countries which is uh, mainly having this free trade agreement means there will be no government tariffs, there will be like no quota restrictions and there will be no subsidies or prohibitions to inhibit their exchange. And the concept of this free trade it is opposed to the concept of trade protectionism that means we have to protect our in domestic industries. And this free trade agreement can be categorized as preferential trade agreement, comprehensive economic cooperation agreement, comprehensive economic partnership agreement that is SEPA. Okay, so this is about some facts regarding this free trade agreement. So if we are talking about what is the significance of this free trade agreement between India and UK. So what is the significance? So first one is it will help for increasing of uh, exports of our goods from Indian side. Okay, so trade deals with the UK could boost exports of our large job creating sectors like textiles, leather goods and footwear. Okay, and that will be helpful for increasing of exports. And next one is clarity on service and trade. So, if we are talking about this free trade agreement, it is expected to mainly provide certainty and predictability and transparency and that will also create a more liberal, facilitative and competitive service regime as well. Okay, and they will be also giving great potential for increasing exports in the service sector like IT, IT sector, nursing, education, healthcare, including Ayush, audiovisual services, etc. And next one is exit from RCEP. So India opted out of Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership deal in November 2019. And therefore, there is a renewed focus on trade deals with the US, European Union and as well as the UK. And if you are talking about next one that is strategic advantage. So UK is a permanent member of the United Nations Security Council. Okay. So UK is one of the permanent member of this United Nations Security Council and is also one of the strategic partners of India. So because of this we can have a good uh, relationship with UK such that uh, UK can also support the global issues uh, for example standoff with China in Ladakh sector and also it can also support a permanent seat India claim for permanent seat in this United Nations Security Council as well. So this will be the significance and if you are talking about what are the challenges. So first one is if you say that in introduction I said that we are going to conclude this FTA by end of 2022. So there might be some delays in the signing of this FTAs. So whenever we are going for signing of this interim agreements okay and that will be mainly reducing the tariffs on some products and, uh, and that will lead to significant delays in achieving of this comprehensive FTAs. And next one is WTO challenges that is uh, World Trade Organization challenges. So interim FTA do not graduate into full FTA. So because of this, whenever we are signing this interim FTAs, that will be having some challenges, okay, from other countries at this WTO. So these are the some important things that you need to remember regarding this topic. And now let us try to see next topic. It is regarding sex and violence, okay. It is regarding sex and violence. So this article which is mainly talking about this marital rape. It is about marital rape. So now let us try to see this topic in a very great detail. Already we discussed this topic number of times again once again editorial which mainly talks about this marital rape. So once again let us try to see this topic. So it is time the union government took a categorical stand on the issue of treating marital rape as a criminal offence. Okay. So it is a time the government the union government took a categorical stand on issue of treating this marital rape as a criminal offence. So recently one statement which is given by the Ministry of Women and Child Development. So because of this, this is news again now. So it is a time the union government took a categorical stand regarding issue of treating marital rape as a criminal offence. So whether we need to treat this marital rape as a criminal offence or not. So recently there are a number of petitions that are mainly filed in this Delhi High Court regarding this marital rape. So what happened if you see in 2017 government opposed the removal of this statutory exemption in this section 375 of IPC for rape committed by a man on his wife 
if she is below 18 years of age so if she is below 18 years of age whenever any husband who is mainly having the sexual activity with women okay so that will mainly comes under this marital rape with force whenever the sexual activity that is happening because of force means that will be coming under this marital rape and this marital rape which mainly exempted under this section 375 of ipc and if you are talking about the remarks of union minister for women and child development in parliament also do not throw much light on the matter which mainly held in 2017 she merely said that government was engaged in a process to introduce comprehensive amendments to criminal law okay she mainly focused on introducing of some comprehensive amendments to the criminal law which indicating perhaps that the criminalizing of marital rape is unlikely to be taken in isolation they are not going to take this only marital rape in isolation but here government said that they are going to come up with some comprehensive amendments to this criminal law at the same time our union minister also observed that it would not be advisable to condemn every marriage as a violent one and every man as a man a rapist okay so in 2016 government rejected the concept of this marital rape saying that cannot be applied to indian context okay in 2016 government rejected this uh, concept of this marital rape because especially in india okay in indian culture marriage it is a one of institution right so because of various factors like the level of uh, education illiteracy poverty social customs values religious beliefs and as well as mindset of society they will mainly treat marriage as a sacrament okay so if you are talking about some arguments they are against this uh, criminalizing of rape within marriage because whenever whenever we are treating this marital rape here means the institution of a marriage whole will be ruined and this institution of marriage will be misused and it will be having a no longer hold good the country has adopted this domestic violence law and this law enables complaints against physical and as well as sexual abuse and if you're talking about this ipc okay so if you're talking about this ipc also holds cruelty to be an offense in a domestic context in a domestic context whenever this uh, cruelty is happening it can be an offense so therefore if you see here making this marital rape a criminal offense it is unlikely to ruin this institution of marriage any more than a complaint of domestic violence or cruelty would okay so because of this the report even by this justice uh, js verma committee noted that recommending its removal to an outdated notion of marriage that treated the wife is husband's property so we need to we need to outdate this uh, we need to go for removal of this outdated notation notion that here woman or wife is husband property so in this way here here what happened so here whenever we are looking at a marriage through an an archaeotic lens of a coverture so the view that wife is under the husband's authority always should not be allowed to override the autonomy of married women over their person okay so here here what the author mainly says that whenever we are looking that wife is husband property and wife should be under the husband's authority always should not be allowed to override the autonomy of married women over their person so this is just of this topic and now let us try to see next topic it is regarding modi to spend over 6 hours in city today so if you see this image you can see this is a sri ramanuja charya statue this is also called a statue of equality which is at muchintal okay and uh, this muchintal it is located uh, at the outskirts of hyderabad city okay so now let us try to see the context prime minister narendra modi will spend 6 and 1/2 hours in the city after he arrives shemshabad airport by a special flight okay so if we are talking about details he is going he mainly going to inaugurate institute's golden jubilee celebrations that is icrisat so he will also inaugurate icrisat climate change research facility on plant protection and rapid generation advancement facility and he will also unveil a specially designed logo and a commemorative postal stamp as well okay he will also going to inaugurate the institute golden jubilee celebrations and he will also inaugurate icrisat climate change research facility on plant protection and rapid generation advancement facility and he will also going to unveil a specially designed logo and a commemorative postal stamp as well 
and if you're talking about some facts regarding the statue of equality so this statue it is made up of panch log panch log is, is nothing but uh, it is a combination of five metals for example gold silver copper zinc and brass and it is a, one of the tallest metallic statues in sitting positions in the world wide so in the world wide it is a, one of the tallest metallic statue and this statue it is mainly mounted on 54 feet high based building and the name of the building is Badra Vedi. And this building which mainly comprises of floors and these floors are mainly devoted to Vedic lit digital library and as well as teachers center is present and it also has a theater and even ancient Indian text and an educational gallery is present and it also contains some detailed works of Sri Ramanuja Acharya etc. Okay. So, if you are talking about some facts regarding this Ramanuja Acharya, if you have completed your philosophy there, you can come up uh, with this uh, philosophy in your uh, art and culture like Advaita, 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 Advaita. So, here he is also one person who mainly focused on one important thing, right? So, if you are talking about some facts regarding this Ramanuja Acharya, he was a Hindu theologian, okay, theologian and he was also Indian philosopher and social reformer as well and also he was an important exponent of Sri Vaishnavism tradition and if you're talking about his philosophical foundations mainly influenced even our bhakti movement he mainly worked for upliftment of people okay he mainly worked for spirit of every human beings equal regardless of caste gender creed uh, sex race and as well as nationality as well so this is the idol okay of Sri Ramanuja Acharya right and now let us try to say next topic it is regarding uniform civil code so title says 22nd law commission to study this uniform civil code so now let us try to see some background regarding this article and even some important facts regarding this UCC so if we are talking about context it mainly says that the new law commission could take up the issue of uniform civil code so now you are going to have this 27 new law commission and this commission will be going to take issue of this uniform civil code. So we are talking about details. Actually in the winter session of our parliament on December 1st 2021. So one parliamentarian mainly raised an issue regarding this UCC uniform civil code during the zero hour in the Lok Sabha. So again one more question for you people. So what is this question hour and what is this zero hour? So what is the difference between this question hour and zero hour? Let me know in comment box. So please it is very very near and even UPSC released notification. So please be focused and please uh, please uh, speed up your preparation and try to practice as many tests as possible. And please do repeated revisions, multiple revisions for every 10 to 15 days and that will finally helpful to increase your memory as well. Okay, so these are the studies that you need to follow and now I think you might have already completed your Lakshmi Kant and Polity, right? So you might be knowing about what is the difference between this question hour and as well as zero hour. So let me know what is the difference between this question hour and zero hour, okay? And if you're talking about this uh, topic, so in this context responding to the issue, uh, what happened? We need to have a detailed in-depth study of provisions regarding various personal laws which are governing different communities. For example, we have Hindus, we have Islam, we have Christianity, we have Jainism. So for all these religions, there will be the different, there will be the different uh, personal laws will be present and these personal laws will be governing so on to subject matter, right? So this issue will be referred to this, uh, already this issue was referred to this 21st Law Commission, but the term of this 21st Law Commission ended on 2018. So because of this, this matter will be going to take up, taken up by the 22nd Law Commission of India. So we are talking about this, uh, um, this UCC in our constitution, Article 44 of Indian Constitution. Article 44 of Indian Constitution which mainly provides that state shall endeavor to secure for citizens of, uh, citizens a uniform civil code throughout the territory of India. Throughout the territory of India, Article 44 of Indian Constitution which is going to provide, okay, which is going to provide this UCC. So, if we are talking about some facts regarding this uniform civil code, so this UCC, it is a, it is a one that would mainly provide for one law for the entire country. So, uniform civil code, it will provide one law for the entire country and it will be applicable to the, all the religious communities 
in their personal matters such as regarding marriage, regarding divorce, regarding inheritance, regarding adoption, etc. And this Article 44 of Indian Constitution, which mainly lays down that state shall endeavor to secure this UCC for the citizens throughout the territory. And this Article 44, which mainly comes from DPSP, and this DPSP is present in the part 4 of our Indian Constitution. Right? And these DPSP, they are not justifiable and not enforceable by the court. So, this is one important thing. And if you are talking about some facts regarding this 22nd Law Commission, uh, this 22nd Law Commission which mainly constituted by the government on February 21st, 2020. And the Law Commission of India, it is a non-statutory body which mainly constituted by government of India from time to time. And the commission was originally constituted in 1955, okay. And, the, and, and it is mainly reconstituted every three years, that is the tenure here is three years. These are some important things that you need to remember and now let us try to see next topic. Title says, Villagers resist sanctuary tax for Langur habitat. So, here we need to know some facts regarding this Langur. So, now let us try to see some important details which are given in this article. So, if you see this image, so these are the golden Langurs. So, if we are talking about context, it mainly says that neighbors of this golden Langur habitat in western Assam, okay, western Assam district, they have opposed the move by the state government to upgrade it into a wildlife sanctuary. So, actually the areas of this golden langur which want to be converted as a wildlife sanctuary by Assam government, but here the neighbors uh, which are, who are mainly opposing this move by the state government. So, if we are talking about some details, it mainly says that Kakoi Jana Reserve Forest, okay, Kakoi Jana Reserve Forest, it is a one of the better known uh, home of this golden langur and this area which is mainly found in Assam and Bhutan. So actually these species they are mainly protected under Schedule 1 of Wildlife Protection Act of 1972 and actually it is also listed as uh, among the world's 25 most endangered primates as well. So because of this Assam forest government issued a preliminary notification to convert this area or a patch of forest into this wildlife sanctuary and this move mainly opposed by the people. So this is the image of this langur, right? So here if you see how can you differentiate this langur with the monkey? So for this langur we can see there will be a very very long tail and the face will be like a black in color, right? So if we are talking about some facts, these golden langurs are most uh, most easily recognized by the color of the, their fur. The color of their fur will be like light orange or gold in color. Okay, and one more thing here is this color of this fur will be changed according to the seasons and as well as geography as well. Sometimes we can see gray langurs also. Sometimes we can see gold langurs, right? The color of the young ones differs from the adults. Okay, so color of the young ones it is different from that of adults here. And these langurs are highly dependent on the trees and they will be mainly living on the upper canopy that is highest tallest trees right so because of this reason they are also called as leaf monkeys and if you are talking about habitat of these langurs they are mainly endemic to western assam india and as well as southern bhutan so their habitat is restricted to the region surrounded by four geographical landmarks okay they mainly seen in bhutan manas river sankosh river and as well as brahmaputra river regions so, what are the threats which are mainly faced by these langurs? So, these threats will be important from your means. First one is restricted habitat. So, their habitat which is mainly restricted to natural boundaries further increasing the threat of extinction because of this uh, limited or uh, restricted habitat. So, that will lead to extinction of the species. And next one is habitat fragmentation. The habitat in Assam has fragmented drastically especially after a thrust on rural electrification and as well as massive deforestation. So, there is a uh, ha habitat fragmentation that is seen. And next one is inbreeding, okay. Obstructions such as wires and the gaps in the forest due to felling have increased the threat in inbreeding among the golden langurs, okay. So, there is also like uh, because of wiring, because of some developmental projects. So, because of this, we can see there is a threat which is mainly posted through these langurs. And if you are talking about protection status, they are protected under endangered category of IUCN red list 
and they are listed under appendix 1 of sites and they are protected under schedule 1 of uh, wildlife protection act of 1972 and now let us try to see next topic is regarding china pakistan inc uh, sorry china pakistan inc new cpec agreement it is talking about china pakistan economic corridor so this article is very important from your international relations which mainly comes under gs paper 2 and now let's try to see this topic in a very great detail so if you're talking about context it mainly says that china and pakistan they signed a new agreement china and pakistan they signed a new agreement on industrial cooperation so actually this is a part of our china pakistan economic corridor okay so this is the plan or this plan which mainly came up during this uh, pakistan's uh, Prime Minister visit to Beijing on this Winter Olympic starting day. So, if we are talking about details, it mainly says that. So, the industrial cooperation agreement, it is a key part of what is the what is being called as the phase two of this economic uh, comprehensive economic sorry that is China Pakistan economic corridor. So, in this uh, phase two of this CPEC, they are mainly focusing on this industrial cooperation. If we are talking about the phase one. They mainly involved in Chinese investments in energy products and they came up with this road infrastructure etc in this phase 1. But in the phase 2 they are mainly focusing on this industrial cooperation and the agreement between this Pakistan's board of investment and this NDRC and they are mainly focusing on boosting of Chinese investments in the Pakistan and even they mainly talking about transferring of Chinese industrial capacity also. Okay. So they are focusing on boosting of Chinese investment and second one is transferring of Chinese industrial capacity and the framework will mainly promote industrialization and even they will focus on development of economic zone and they will initiate, they will plan and they will execute and monitor the projects in both public and as well as in private sector. Okay, so the framework will promote, so this framework will promote industrialization and also they will focus on uh, economic zones and they will be uh, initiating plan and execute the monitor projects okay they will be going for execution of projects both in a uh, public and as well as in the private sector so we are talking about some facts regarding this uh, china pakistan economic corridor so actually this project is a bilateral project between china and pakistan and this project it is mainly focusing to promote connectivity across the pakistan and they are going to come up with highways uh, roadways and as well as railways sorry highways railways and as well as pipeline projects and they also coming up with some investments in infrastructure especially in the areas like energy industries and other infrastructure and development projects and the important aim it is to connect Xinjiang province okay in the important aim it is to connect Xinjiang province with the Gwadar port which is located in the which is located in the Balchistan and they are mainly connected to this Kunjara Pass, okay, in the northern parts of Pakistan. So this will be helpful, especially for China. China will have the access uh, access to the Middle East and as well as Africa from this Gwadar port, right? And this CPEC is a mainly the part of BRI Belt and Road Initiative. Actually, this BRI, which mainly launched in 2013, and it also aims to link the Southeast Asia. Central Asia, the Gulf region, Africa and Europe with a network of land and the sea routes. So with the network of land and sea routes, they are going to they are going to connect the Southeast Asia, Central Asia and as well as Gulf region. So India which is mainly affected or severely which is which is mainly opposing the CPEC because so this project which is mainly passing through this park occupied Kashmir. Actually this POK park occupied Kashmir is a disputed territory between India and Pakistan. Okay, so if you're talking about this project here, we have this Kashgar. Kashgar it is in Xinjiang province and it is mainly passing through this POK, it is park occupied Kashmir and it is moving in Kashmir, right? And finally, it is mainly connecting with this Gwadar port which is located in this Pakistan. So here, whenever here uh, this whenever this project is completed means China can easily have the access uh, to this Arabian Sea and it will enter into this uh, African countries easily. Okay, so this is about the map of this CPEC. So now let us try to see yesterday's questions. So first question is regarding fundamental rights. So already you know that fundamental rights which are located in the part 3 of our Indian constitution and they are enforceable. 
and also justifiable in the court of law. So the first question here is which of the following fundamental rights they are available only to the citizens of India but not to foreigners. So here you have to remember those uh, those uh, articles okay 15, 16, 19, 29 and 30 they are available only to citizens of India. So first one is prohibition of uh, discrimination on the grounds of religion, race caste, sex and the place of birth. Yes, this will be available. And next one is freedom to manage, freedom to manage the serious affairs. It will be not available. It is will be available for both uh, Indians and as well as foreigners. And next one is protection of language, script and culture of minorities. Yes. Next one is protection against arrest and detention. In certain cases, it is not available. It is available for both uh, students and foreigners. And next one is right to elementary education. It is also available for both. So the uh, answer here is A and C that is option 1 is correct answer and next one is right to property this is very interesting question right to property was under major controversy since its inception in the constitution of India so with regard to this present position consider the following so first one is it is a constitutional right yes in our constitution under article 300 so there is a right to property that is present at present right now uh, so it is a constitutional right and Supreme Court can issue writ jurisdiction for the violation of the right. So we can issue the writ under Article 32 whenever there is a violation of fundamental right. Now it is not a fundamental right, so we cannot issue the writ. And next one is the right to property was deleted from fundamental rights by 42nd Constitutional Amendment Act, but is by 44th Constitutional Amendment Act. So this statement is also incorrect. So you have to choose the correct statements. So first statement is only correct. So correct option is A2 only. Right? And now let us see the today's questions. So before seeing today's questions, I want to make a small announcement on this platform. If you want to clear this UPSC, I will strongly suggest you to join this prelims test series and as well as mains answer writing course that we are offering in this Rathod's IES Academy. So this prelims test series which mainly contains 30 tests which includes both CSAT and as well as UAGS. And in the mains answer writing course, okay, and in this mains answer writing course, we are mainly giving you the weekly targets of syllabus of GS1 to GS4, GS1, GS2, GS3, GS4. And based on that weekly targets, daily one question will be given to you. Daily one question will be given to you. And there will be the modal answer will also be given. And there will be evaluation of your answer. And as well as we also provide you one to one mentorship regarding this mains answer writing course as well okay so this course it is exclusively beneficial because one thing you need to keep in your mind is mains it is a deciding factor that will do uh, that will make or break the deal because if you're getting good marks in the mains finally you can see the your name will be present in your final list for sure because uh, prelims it is option uh, prelims it is like a qualifying paper even if you're getting 180 or even if you're getting 110 you will be there in the race and if you are talking about interview, it will be not there in your hands. The thing which will be there in your hands here is a mains. Okay. So if you are uh, excelling or if you are nailing this art of answer writing, then you can easily clear this UPSC. So this is one year course and you are going to cover each and every topic of your syllabus of GS1, GS2, GS3, GS4. And we are going to complete entire syllabus within one year. So I will assure you that you are going to complete this static syllabus of GS1 to GS4 within one year for sure along with that year current FIs. Right, so please try to join this course, it is absolutely useful. And the batch which mainly started on February 1st and the registrations for this February batch it is going to be closed on 8th February. So please try to join this course. Okay. And apart from that we also launched this entire foundation course for UPSC CSC. And in this foundational course, we are providing more than 70, 700 hours of video recorded lectures. And we are covering each and every single topic that is in your syllabus. And even conceptual clarity, which is mainly assured here. Okay. And one more thing here is the trend of UPC has been changed from asking factual based questions to analytical based questions. To answer those analytical based questions in both prelims and mains, you need to have the conceptual clarity. And we are providing that conceptual clarity here. And apart from this foundation course, if you want to take individual course like economy, history, geography, disaster management, environment and ecology, science and technology, you can also take that individual courses. So details of this course are given in description box. You can see that. And if you want to watch the demo videos, you can visit our website, Rathos IS Academy. 
there you can watch three videos in each, each and every module without paying a single penny okay so this is about these courses and one more thing is if you want to talk directly to me uh, regarding these courses you can call to this number 8074765513 and academic director of the strathors is academy and you can trust us okay whatever the thing we are saying we are doing that and if you want to download this Arthur's IS app, link is also given in the description box. You can download the app. So now let us try to see the today's questions. It is regarding the first one is rule of equality before law. Okay. So in Indian context, the rule of equality before law, it is not absolute. There are certain exceptions. You have to identify those exceptions here. And next one is Article 19. Article 19 of Indian Constitution, which mainly guarantees six rights under the right to freedom. So consider the following with reference to freedom of movement. So these are the two statements which are given and you have to select the correct answer. So let me know your answer in the comment box. Don't forget to give the answers. There is no negative marking here. So by this I am concluding. I hope you enjoyed this lecture. Please subscribe to Rathor's IS Academy and don't forget to like, share and comment my videos. And don't forget to enroll to these courses. So by this I am concluding. Thank you so much.